today's scandal story time was suggested by JC in the comments. So thank you very much, uh, JC, because I had a lot of fun digging into this one. We're sort of going into new territory today because we're talking about uh, college football for the first time. Now, the college in question is Southern Methodist University, SMU for short, uh, based in Texas. It's a, it's a private research university. Um, and this story takes place in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, sort of into the mid 80s. Um, now, at the time, SMU, SMU's football program, uh, they were the second smallest school in the Southwest Conference. I think uh, Rice was the only smaller school. So, since the 1950s, um, SMU found it difficult to compete with um, or against schools that were, you know, double their size or more. Uh, in fact, prior to the scandal that we're getting into, uh, SMU only had nine winning seasons since 1949. So mind you, in about 30 years, uh, they only had nine seasons where they won more games than they lost. So that gives you an idea of what kind of program it was and what kind of sort of seasons and reputation that they had. So, in the late 70s, more people start paying attention to SMU football. Uh, in the 1978 season, or rather the off season, so the season between 77-78 and 78-79, uh, the university launched a sort of media campaign, an ad campaign, and it worked really, really well. Uh, it actually doubled the average home attendance from the 77 season. They had about, you know, 25, 26,000 uh, people in attendance on average for their game. And the very next season, 1978, it went up to an average of 52,000 people. So, a huge, huge difference there. But even though attendance grew, that didn't immediately translate to success on the field for SMU. And now, Ron Meyer was uh, the SMU coach since the winter of 1975. So, you know, fairly new when you're looking at that losing um, sort of average, losing season average. That being said, uh, in his first four years, as the coach of SMU football, he led the team to a record of just 16 and 27. So it's not like he came in and made a big splash. He was sort of, you know, he had the right ideas, but he wasn't, uh, wasn't able to make those ideas a reality with the squad that he had. Um, in fact, he felt that the SMU squad was lacking in both talent and size. Obviously, with a small school, it's, it's much more difficult to get that full squad size. And so that's where he thought that the team, that the squad was struggling. They needed better players. 
and more of them. So, he decided to adopt a very aggressive recruiting strategy to fix that problem. Uh, and in fact, um, former SMU quarterback Lance McIlhenny, um, he later referred to Meyer as the greatest salesman he'd ever met. So, Meyer, he begins, you know, recruiting, or pursuing, at least, all of the best football players in Texas. Uh, but this is where it gets, it gets tricky. Not all of his recruits, uh, were recruited in what you might call the ethical way, uh, or even the permitted way. See, under his direction, under his instructions, the recruiting staff started paying players to come to SMU. Uh, according to Steve Endicott, he, he was one of the recruiters under Meyer. The first payments uh, started at Kashmir High School in Houston. He said it was Ron, myself, Robin Budecki, and maybe another coach. I can't pin it down. It was maybe 20 or 50 bucks or something like that that we gave. Uh, the Kashmir high school football players actually started calling the SMU recruiters Santa Claus because of this. But those little payments of $20, they eventually grew into $500. Um, that's about $2,000, maybe a little more today. Uh, and there were also gifts from boosters, and that's even more impactful on the players. Um, boosters are essentially people who uh, donate to, you know, these sports programs, um, these athletic programs, kind of separate from the university. Very often, they are alumni, they are past players at universities. Uh, one of the players who received compensa compensation from a booster, uh, he was Reggie Dupart, who ended up being an NFL first round pick. And he admitted to receiving money and a car while he was at SMU to play for SMU. And uh, that quarterback that I mentioned, Lance, Miguel Henny. Uh, in 2022, he said that when he was in college, when he was at SMU, he confronted his coach about, you know, other players receiving basically envelopes of cash. And the next day, he found $700 in his locker. So essentially, form of hush money, kind of saying, look, other guys are getting money, now you got money too, so you can be happy, and you can stop worrying about it, stop talking about it here. All of this, um, you know, did end up being productive, though, for the Mustangs, the Mustangs being the SMU football team, uh, in 1980, they qualified for their first bowl game in years. Um, they faced BYU in the 1980 Holiday Bowl, and they ultimately lost to BYU 46 to 45. So, not only are they showing up for their first bowl game, in recent memory, but it's a, it's a narrow loss. It's almost a win. But 
you know, because of that big shift, SMU's recruiting tactics, they had not gone unnoticed. And so, right after that holiday bowl game, SMU was put on probation by the NCAA. Uh, they were given a one-year bowl suspension and a television ban as well. Um, as, as a result of recruiting violations, you're not allowed to pay your recruits to choose to come to your school. Uh, but despite receiving this, this penalty, uh, the team went on to win the SWC championship. Meyer did resign at the end of the season, um, but maybe not for the reason that you think. He actually resigned to go and take the head coaching job with the New York, uh, the New England Patriots. You know, that, that little team you never hear about. Now, he was replaced by a guy called Bobby Collins. And in 1982, the, the Mustangs finished unbeaten in the season and won the Cotton Bowl. Uh, Collins de de then led SMU to two more bowls in the next two seasons. So it was a loss in the 1983 Sun Bowl, and then a win in the 1984 Aloha Bowl. And they also ended up winning three conference titles in four years. So all of a sudden, even after, you know, being put on probation and receiving some, some bans and violations from the NCAA, their stock keeps rising and they keep sort of improving and being more and more of a winning team. Now, around that time, the NCAA continued to investigate SMU, right? It seemed like um, their continued success and their continued recruitment uh, despite their success, still a little bit fishy to the NCAA. And ultimately, the NCAA handed SMU um, more probations. Uh, and those came as a result of um, basically an investigation into the uh, recruiting practices of you know, several assistant coaches and, um, and team boosters. The team boosters were a known sort of problem uh, as far as the NCAA was concerned. Uh, in fact, Sean Stopridge, he was an offensive lineman from Pennsylvania. He was part of the 1983 uh, recruiting class. He had initially given an oral commitment to the University of Pittsburgh uh, to attend and play for them. But he told investigators, as part of this NCAA investigation, that uh, he and his family had received over $10,000 in 1980s money from SMU to sort of walk back that commitment to the University of Pittsburgh and sign with the Mustangs instead. So the NCAA, they figured they had to come down harder on SMU um, than they had in previous years because this was a recurring problem despite, you know, probation. So now, SMU uh, 
was not allowed to grant any new football scholarships for the 1985 season, uh, and only 15 scholarships were available for 1986. When you're talking about a squad of 70 players, you know, 15 is not that many. Uh, they also received a two-year postseason ban for those two seasons and a, a complete ban from live television for 1986. So, 85 and 86 being the years that were affected um, by these, this round of, of uh, in violations and infractions and, and probations. And this time, uh, the Mustangs' on-field performance did suffer. So, they entered the 1985 season as the third-ranked team, according to the Associated Press. They fell to number 16 after sort of a blowout loss to Arizona. And then they just completely dropped out of the rankings uh, the next week, the very next week, after a loss to Baylor. They finished 6-5 and five for that year, so, you know, barely a winning season. And compared to their, you know, previous few seasons, um, quite a dramatic downturn. Then in 1986, they actually started off well. They started out with a 5-1 and one record, uh, but they ended up finishing at 6-5 and five again, so they couldn't hang on to that, you know, call it strength of schedule maybe, but two se seasons of a row, in a row, going from conference champions to 6-5 and five seasons. But Back to 1985, uh, after SMU was sanctioned, the most recent time, the NCAA called an emergency meeting, basically to deal with, um, you know, all these violations that had been uncovered in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, again, SMU they weren't the only ones, but they were by far the worst ones, at least that the NCAA knew about. <laughs> so at that meeting, uh, the NCAA council, they put in place some new rules uh, to try to, you know, combat this problem. And maybe the most impactful uh, decision from that meeting was to reinforce their power to shut down uh, athletic programs that were found guilty of, you know, egregious violations. Uh, this is commonly referred to as the death penalty of NCAA. So they created this new bylaw called the Repeat Violator Rule. And that rule stated that if a school had been found guilty of two major violations in a five-year period, then if they could be, you know, banned, that the sport in question, the sports program in question, could be banned from competing, um, for up to two years, and if the two violations happened in separate sports programs, then it would be the second sport in question, but that that's just a detail, because with SMU we're talking about football strictly. So, yeah, they were allowed to ban, according to the repeat violator rule, banned that program that committed those two violations, for up to two seasons. Now, the NCAA had only banned seasons twice in its history. Uh, the first time was in the early 50s, 
and it was the Kentucky men's basketball. And the second time was in the early 70s, from 73 to 75. And that was uh, southern, southwestern Louisiana's men's basketball. Uh, however, now, in cases where a repeat violator uh, was eligible for this death penalty, for the two-year ban, the NCAA had to either hand down that penalty or explain why it chose not to. So, all of a sudden, there's accountability at the NCAA level to enforce uh, those, you know, those rules with maybe a heavier hand. The new rule passed. Even though six schools, uh, including, obviously, SMU, voted against it. So, SMU is on very thin ice. We should not be surprised that they voted against the repeat violator rule. And in June of 1986, John Sparks, who is a news producer out of Dallas. He receives a tip from a former uh, athletic department administrator or employee at SMU called Teresa Hawthorne about more wrongdoings at SMU that had not been investigated by the NCAA or internally or by anyone. So Sparks investigates the tip, and he eventually falls, or lands, I should say, on uh, David Stanley, who, at this point in 1986, is a former uh, Mustangs linebacker. Now, Stanley was actually part of that same recruiting class as uh, Sean Stopbridge in 1983. Um, but unfortunately, Stanley dealt with uh, substance use addiction, and Bobby Collins eventually cut him from the team. Now, Stanley decided to continue to attend SMU, get his education, and he was actually very close to getting his degree when SMU rescinded the rest of his scholarship. Um, he tried to appeal the decision, but SMU would not budge, and he left the school. So, Sparks, the news producer, he speaks with Stanley, and Stanley says that SMU paid him 25 grand to sign for the Mustangs in 1983, uh, which is worth about triple that amount today. It's about 75 grand. And then they continued to pay him on a monthly basis while he played for the team. He also says that um, his mother and father were given money. Um, the news crew later gave them sort of like polygraph tests, lie detector tests, and came came back to, even though they're not, you know, reliable tests, the results came back that they were telling the truth. Um, now, if these allegations from the Stanleys proved to be true, that would mean that SMU was still paying players after being put on probation by the NCAA and obviously after promising that those payments had stopped. So, in October, about four months after receiving that tip, the news crew meets with Collins, the coach, uh, SMU's athletic director, Bob Hitch, 
and um, an administrative assistant, Henry Lee Parker. Remember that name. So, you know, with cameras on, they confront the three guys um, with the accusations from the Stanleys. And of course, they deny everything. What they don't know is that the news crew is in possession of a pair of envelopes that had allegedly been sent to the Stanleys uh, with money inside. And one of those envelopes is essentially the smoking gun. See, the envelope was addressed to Mrs. Harley Stanley, so Stanley's mom. It had come directly from the recruiting office, um, and the initials HLP were in the corner. So remember, Henry Lee Parker. They were written out in the corner, and it was in the same handwriting as Stanley's home address on the envelope. Uh, so, you know, the, the envelope was also post postmarked uh, with the date of October 4th, 1985, which is after SMU had been placed on their most recent probation. So, essentially, this would make SMU a repeat violator. So, during the initial questioning of those three guys from, from the SMU football program, before they re revealed the envelope, uh, they asked Parker if he had ever sent any money to the Stanley family. Any mail, actually. Not money, but mail. And Parker says no. So, the news crew, the host, the journalist, takes out the envelopes and hands them to Parker. And they point out the one in particular with Parker's initials and the, the postmark date. Yeah, that's what it's called. And they ask Parker if those envelopes were his. And he says yes. And then they sort of repeat and go, did you write it? But then Parker puts on a pair of reading glasses. He goes, These are printed, and I do not. And then he sort of trails off and gives the envelopes to his, you know, his colleagues. You can see the interview, it's on YouTube, it's pretty interesting. Um, but the the news crew and the, the host, actually, his name is Dale Hansen. Um, they later, later said that if Parker had lied about the contents of the envelope, then the investigation would have stopped dead cold, and they would have had to find another lead into this story. Um, you know, years later, Dale Hansen said, uh, that was the defining moment. All Parker had to say was, I'm glad you asked. I sent him an insurance form, and we would have had to start all over, because every dot that we connected started from the premise that we know he sent something. So, obviously, this made Hanson, Hanson and Sparks and the news crew even more suspicious of what was going on. So, as part of the investigation, Sparks asks Peter to submit a handwriting sample uh, for analysis. And the expert, the handwriting expert that they consulted, he confirms that it's a match. So, Parker wrote the envelope. And this expert is willing to testify under oath if it comes to it. So, 
on November 12th, 1986. The investigation with that, you know, clip of the recording and interviews with Stanley and other people, it airs as a 40 minute uh, post news special in Dallas, Fort Worth. Fort Worth. And in the special, it's mentioned that Stanley has also, at this point, talked directly to the NCAA and that an NCAA investigation into this is well underway. So it's not just, you know, for the news, they're actually, they called in the right people to have a look at this even before the NCAA investigation, the special report aired on TV. Two days later, the morning news reports that starting tight end Albert Reese was living rent-free in a Dallas apartment. Uh, that rent was being paid by George Owen, one of the boosters, who uh, had actually already been banned from participating in any way uh, with the athletic program for taking part in the events that led to the 1986-85 probation. So Reese, uh, the student with the free apartment, <laughs> he was suspended for the last two games of the season pending this investigation. Now, eventually, uh, the NCAA, their investigation revealed that in 1985 and 1986, 13 players had been paid a total of $61,000 from a slush fund uh, provided by a booster. And that the payments ranged from $50 to $725 per month. Uh, and they had started, that sort of slush fund, those payments, had started only a month after SMU had been handed its latest probation. So, soon after uh, the investigation dropped, Hitch, Collins, and Parker, all three resigned. Uh, and according to a later investigation by another school, uh, all three were paid $850,000 in severance, essentially to keep quiet about the whole situation. So you kind of wonder who else was involved or had knowledge of this happening at the school for them to be paid that sum of money for an NDA. So where did this leave SMU? Well, there starts being speculation about SMU or the possibility of SMU uh, receiving that death penalty from the NCAA, the two-year ban. So, in February of 1987, SMU sends the NCAA a sort of proposal, a sort of plea offer, I guess. They say, that their probation should be extended uh, another four years, which brings us into 1990. Uh, that during this period, SMU would only hire six assistant coaches, and they also recommended. I'm sorry, my stomach is making so many noises today. They also uh, recommended SMU that their ban from bowl games uh, and live television be extended until 1989. 
so another three years. Uh, the NCAA enforcement staff was pretty impressed with SMU's cooperation. Um, so much so, in fact, that they recommended that the infractions committee of the NCAA accept SMU's, you know, proposed penalties, plus add a ban on non-conference play for two years. Well, the infractions committee, they were not going to have it. In fact, um, after SMU and the NCAA Enforcement Office um, delivered their recommendations, the Infractions Committee subjected both of those groups to some pretty um, stern questioning about, you know, what, 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 who do you think we are? What do you think we're doing here? What's, what's the big idea kind of thing? And before the end of February, the committee voted unanimously to cancel SMU's entire 1987 season, football season at least, and all four of SMU's scheduled home games for 1988. Um, they said that this was an order to eliminate a program that was built on a legacy of wrongdoing, deceit, and rule violation. Uh, the committee also said that SMU's record was nothing short of abysmal, and the school had made no effort to reform itself over the past decade. You know, they keep going on probation, and then they keep repeating the violations that they're on probation for, so clearly they're not learning. They're not willing to stop doing uh, what, what they're doing. Um, and, you know, the committee, as part of their decision, also said that SMU had gained a great competitive advantage uh, over its opponents as a result of these violations and this, what they essentially call cheating, which it is. The committee did praise SMU, though, for cooperating uh, with the investigation, and apparently their cooperation is what saved SMU from the full death penalty, from those that two-year ban. Uh, so now, because there would be no season in 1987, a full release was granted to every player on the Mustangs, and most of them did leave to go play for other schools. That meant that SMU was left without many experienced players, um, and in fact, in 1988, they would be fielding a squad of, you know, walk-ons and rookies essentially. So SMU itself, themselves, <laughs> decided to cancel the 1988 season as well, uh, while they sort of rebuilt the team and the program. So even though they were not handed um, the full death penalty, the result was the same. Two seasons of no play. And the echoes of that rebuild are still felt today for SMU. Uh, over the past 34 seasons since they resumed play in 1989, uh, SMU has played 393 regular season games with a win rate of only 0.367. So they're only winning about 37% of their games since they've rebuilt 30-some years ago. In fact, um, 
the NCAA can be a bit hesitant, a bit timid um, about handing down the death penalty today. Um, and in fact, they've stopped short of, of handing down the death penalty to other schools since then um, because they see the sort of the effect that it had on the program. But they also offer SMU as a comparison to sort of save themselves from shutting down modern, you know, football programs or sports programs because they argue that whatever infractions that, you know, a, a school, whatever school commits isn't as bad as SMU, you know, they'll say, oh well, after we put them on probation, you know, they took some steps to not repeat the violations. So even, even if they do repeat it, they will look at the track record of a school and go, well, you know what, at least they, it wasn't as bad as SMU, so let's not give the, the SMU penalty. But that is the story of the Southern Methodist University football scandal. Again, thank you, JC, for recommending this story in the comments of a previous video. I found it super interesting. I love it when you guys sort of point me in the direction of a story that you like to hear on the channel. And with that being said, I'll see you tomorrow for the next video.